Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, good people, wherever you may be. Welcome back to the Black Hat Chat. Just two witches that get together every Friday and talk about magic and witchcraft from across the globe. Uh, I'm Lee Johnson, Red Oak, and over there is Rev Kai. I got it right two weeks in a row. Two weeks, <laughs> all right. Two weeks in a row, first time. <laughs> And if you'd like to find us anywhere, apart from here, of course, uh, just have a look in the uh, description. There's a link in there, a um, a, a link tree uh, link. I got it right. Yes, not yes. LinkedIn. Link tree. Yes. Um, and you'll find us on Discord under Wildwood Temple, and also there's a Facebook group, a uh, sort of community that we created for people just to come along and chat about whatever they want to, uh, in a safe, safe space. So now just a quick announcement. We are going to be publishing one of the what's on the telly, um, reviews that we do for our Patreon and buy me a coffee or not buy me a coffee. It's now on coffee, um, supporters. And we do two a month. We are publishing one to the public. So this coming month, it's going to be a toss-up between the Velocipasta. <laughs> Can't help not <laughs> laughing when we say that name. And Lovecraft Country. So there will be a poll after the show. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. It'll be on the Discord server. And we'll put one on Facebook group as well and on, in the Wildwood Temple. Um, so you can vote for which one you would like to see, and then we'll put the most voted one up. In January. In January, yes. Beginning of January. All right, then. So today's show is about the solstice, the winter solstice, solstice, and the summer solstice. Too many <laughs> S's in there. Say that five times fast, right? Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I couldn't even say it once. <laughs> That's why we say Yule and Midsummer. Yes, easier that way. <laughs> Shall we start with Midsummer? Because I, I, there isn't actually much I, I, I can find on Midsummer. Yule's just a fantastic one, so we'll get into that one. We'll get really in depth in it. Um, but mid, Midsummer's, I mean, it's the summer summer solstice, so it's the celebration of the middle of summer, and therefore it's when the sun is at its apex, really, at its zenith. And uh, so you've got the longest day and the shortest night. And then we start moving back into the darker period of the year, of the wheel. So it's very much about the sun, celebrating the sun, the power of the sun. Um, some old uh, traditions one I sort of sort of remember, not sure if we actually ever did it, but for some reason I remember it, was rolling um, burning wheels down a hill. Mm. And then the young young people jump over it. And the higher they jump, the higher the crops will grow, um, things like that. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's really just a celebration of the sun. Healing, fertility, um, you know, that... that the excitement, the life, uh, before we start moving back into the darkest day. So abundance as well. Um, I think nowadays we could bring a lot of prosperity and abundance type of ritual and magic into it. Um, oh, there was one thing I read which I found a bit, I'm not sure, odd or interesting. Um, it stated there are three times during the year when we... Um, are closest with the Fae, and that's Midsummer, Beltane, and Samhain. Hmm. I thought that would more be uh, Yule than Midsummer. Well, Midsummer and, and Yule are very much two sides of the same coin. Uh, just mm. like when we talked about Beltane and Samhain are very much connected. And they, you know, they're both extremes in sunlight mm -hmm. and the connection to the sun. And there's, there's lots of lore connected with um, the Fae 
and the the doorways to the other world through both of those seasons and it's it's kind of like from Beltane to Midsummer is the doorway just like from Samhain to Yule is the doorway mm -hmm. and the solstice points are the the crossover points where we cross the boundary um in some heathen reckonings midsummer is the start of winter and the end of summer because it's the end of the growth time of the sun and the beginning mm -hmm. of the decline and then yule is the other way yule is the start of summer and the end of winter because from now on it will be a growing time instead of a declining time for the sun and that's really weird to think about when you're in the middle of either of those seasons when it is midsummer it's bloody hot and you're not thinking about it being winter at all <laughs> the idea that like mm -hmm. this is the beginning of winter seems crazy same for yule you know um it doesn't seem like it's the beginning of summer when you wake up and it's freezing cold and probably still snowing and all of that sort of thing but if you think of summer as the time of growth and you think of winter as a time of decline those are the cross points and mm. those points are like the closing of the window so after midsummer it all turns to harvest mm. instead of growing it's no longer the 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 growth the production phase now it's the reaping that's going to happen and after yule instead of storage and harvesting and stocking away it's time to use the stock and plan for the growth so mm -hmm. you know it is a a boundary that crosses yeah that makes perfect sense because i mean you are you're working you're moving from a light time into a dark time or a dark time into a light time um and as you said, I mean, from mid after midsummer, and then you start preparing for the winter. Mm -hmm. So it is the harvest and the, the collection and the storage and everything else which goes on during that phase, and then after that, the opposite. Um, mm -hmm. So it makes it actually makes perfect sense. And um, both yeah. of these solstice points have that um, the king is dead, long live the king kind of energy to them. Mm. You know. And the old Celtic reconstructionist, well, not the old, the modern Celtic reconstructionism, but that actually mostly came out of the Golden Bough with the Holly King and the Oak King. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember a while a while back I was reading somewhere, somebody mentioned um, or asked the question of why the Holly King, because the Holly King is evergreen. Um, you know, whereas but... the Oak King, some oaks are evergreen, some oaks aren't. I think. I'm right. Oaks are not evergreen. Oaks are deciduous. No, no. Um, but the holly fruits in the winter, it dies back in the summer and stops its growth phase, even though it maintains its leaves uh, mm. because it's an evergreen bush. Uh, but it's also the holly is not um, as thorny in the winter. Holly is a boundary keeper um and it's a protective thing and the thorns grow and get bigger and i think more itchy in the winter um mm -hmm. as opposed to the summer when you can tell that the plant kind of goes dormant and, and dies back a bit and i did have uh, some holly bushes that it was towards the end of their life but the last three or four summers they dropped their leaves and mm -hmm. then grew new leaves in the winter and every winter i was like are you are you gonna make it was that it <laughs> you know because eventually they do die mm -hmm. um one other thing about uh midsummer the, another name for it is litha which um mm -hmm. if I remember correctly is anglo-saxon but it it apparently only became popular after it was mentioned in Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings. Oh, the name Litha? Hmm. Hmm. Don't know how true that was. Now, in Anglo-Saxon lore, there's lots. Midsummer's a big day. Um, mm -hmm. It's associated uh, with the Feast of John the Baptist. 
and uh, lots of lore about dragons and wells, or in Anglo-Saxon, the Verms. Um, these are spirits or sometimes uh, corporeal entities that can poison the holy wells that spit into them. And there's rituals that go with bathing and renewing the wells and protecting them as the source of the blessing, um, holy essence that flows from within the earth, the lifeblood of the mm -hmm. earth. And so there is that kind of battle um that occurs on midsummer like it does on yule uh, mm. and so there's rituals going with protecting the wells there's rituals going with uh bathing in the sacred wells and like yule midsummer is a tide it's not um one night or just one day uh, it's a bit longer than that which I think is very interesting because we can time the solstice very well. You know, mm -hmm. there there is a physical phenomenon where you can be like, yep, that night was the shortest or that night was the longest because it changes. You mm -hmm. can observe that. You don't need, you know, great crazy calculations. You just need to keep track of a sunrise and sunset. So it is definitely a single night that is the solstice but both of them we extend as tides of celebration and ritual and and that sort of thing and i think it's because there's just there's so much to do <laughs> you can't cram it all into one day uh you need to you need to have some some time to figure out that it happened because it's always in hindsight oh it's longer today <laughs> <laughs> um unless you're calculating forward like an astronomer you know uh but you know there's the at midsummer there's uh the protecting the well the sealing the well the waiting for the tide to pass the time of danger and then opening the well back up and greeting the uh powers that guard the well the spirits that guard the well and then bathing in it for uh the coming dark time i suppose it would have also been traveling to the well yeah which for some could have taken a while yes yes yeah. so you know we've got midsummer with the water in the wells the holy wells and the height of suna the the brightness of the sun so there's our water and sunlight and then at yule we have fire and snow yule is mm. is there's all sorts of fire traditions concerned with yule from yule logs to candles to the modern sun weight and, and all of those sorts of things returning the light greeting the solstice dawn all of those things but in um midsummer we're working with the water because the sun is very very prominent nature is providing all of that heat and sun. And so we're adding water, we're seeking out holy wells, we're bathing, we're doing all of this water stuff. And at Yule, it's the other way around. Nature is providing plenty of water in the form of snow and wet mm. and, and that sort of thing, and ice, and we're adding fire. We're, <laughs> we're burning Yule bring logs and, and lighting candles. And there's lots of lore about bringing the light back, bringing the sun back, seeing the sun back up, returning the light. Mm -hmm. um, even though we don't have really a counterpart to that at summer um, of like getting the sun to go away. I don't know. I felt that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love you, but go to sleep. You know? <laughs> Time to rest. Yeah. Things have been scorched, absolutely scorched. <laughs> Although I actually, I actually believe that um, midsummer there's there's a lot of um, usage of, of the bale fire mm. um, from the aspect of celebration of the actual sun itself. Uh, I mean, as I said, the the burning wheels and things like that, and the sun wheel itself. Um, so there is that fire aspect in the celebrations, but 
yeah, yeah. traveling to the sacred wells was definitely something that was midsummery. And I mean, there's also just the fact that all of the Sabbaths get called the fire festivals. You yeah. know. Because it's about the sun, yeah. Yeah, it's all about the sun. It's all sun reckoning. It's all about the light. It, you know, all of those sorts of things. So when we want to make light, we light fires. Mm. Now, Caleb said, uh, I burn easily. I have absolutely wished that the sun would take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh huh. Uh huh. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, Cara asked anyone from the Scottish Highlands, please. Lonely new witch, but witch all my life subconsciously. Loving vibes to all ginger hearts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't think there's anybody else from the Scottish Highlands here at the moment. Um, but maybe go on to the Wild of Temple and Discord or Facebook. And give a shout out there, maybe there's somebody um, who's on there already that is in the Scottish Highlands. You never know. Um, all right. I'm just having a look at my notes quickly before we move on to Yule. Um, well, as mention of Prometheus from the Greek mythologies, who brought fire to man. Um... Not much else, really. Uh, I'm looking through all of my notes here. Mm. It's the time when when the mother is is more prominent because she's pregnant with the with the um, her the son of or the child of the of the consort, the god. There is about heredity, fertility. Mm -hmm. Um, that's about it. Symbols would be the sun wheel, spirals, spinning and weaving. Midsummer Falling is a, a traditional time for namings uh, because of the process of saining and uh, blessing children with the water from the holy wells. Um, mm. It's a time for troth windings, which is truth finding. It's a kind of, um, I don't know, community divination, right, we might say. Not not necessarily oracular save kind of stuff, but a party that, that involves, you know, finding the true path through the dark times that are coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just um, very quietly move my mic over a little bit. There we go. Uh, when it comes to uh, calendar reckoning, we've got the the problem, no matter what calendar system we're using, that, that stuff just shifts a little bit. You mm. know, um, every calendar system we have needs some adjustment. In modern times, we do that every four years with a leap day. Uh, but in uh, some Icelandic calendar keeping and in some Anglo-Saxon calendar keeping, uh, there was an extra intercalary month that was inserted, and usually it was inserted here around midsummer to keep up with things. Uh, usually it was four days long, but every once in a while it needed to be ten days long to make mm -hmm. things line up again. And so those bits of time out of time, uh, much like we have the uh, dark time from Modranit to the Hogmanay in uh, the other end of the year that, you know, there are taboos against work, there are taboos against um, spinning, there are taboos against all those sorts of things because it's a different kind of time. It's time out of time. It, mm. It's removed from the, the daily flow of things. Um, thing Tide was held around midsummer. Um, like if you're in Iceland, it's the easiest time to travel. So if people had to come from all over everywhere, you know, do it when the ice is the least. <laughs> and <laughs> when you've got this this extra weird month that is offsetting things. Um, so the month wasn't always called Thing Tide, and I don't know what I've done with those notes. They're probably in another notebook. Um, but, you know, it did allow for 
some extra things to be done in the cycle of the year because certain times of certain months where when you do the necessary things when you clean the larder when you harvest the crops when you tend to the cattle all that sort of stuff so those those bits out of time mm -hmm. and then there's uh, why Go ahead. why is it called thing tide because it's a time for the thing and what is the thing the thing is the the big <laughs> meeting we talked about this on our ritual show briefly oh, um, no. just just we're just gonna remind folks this just feels like the rocky horror picture show though uh <laughs> the thing is the big meeting uh to get together and discuss laws and uh air grievances settle disputes all of that sort of stuff got to got to pound out all of that legal stuff at some point and the thing is where everyone comes together and does that um mm. thing is the origin for the parliamentary system thing is also the origin for the um congressional debate system that's used in the u.s uh, they trace their mm. roots right back to that kind of legal assembly and thing, that thing is the origin for our English word thing, even though it doesn't have a very specific meaning anymore. It means any old thing. Mm. Any old thing. <laughs> uh, I thought I read why it was called thing tide, but it doesn't say in here. What I was reading earlier. Okay, so we will scrap that. <clears throat> um. All right. Oh, um, the worms frothing into the wells, uh, frothing, uh, which is uh, spilling their seed into the wells was something that happened around this time of year too. And it was considered to uh, be deadly. It was poisoning the wells. And the way to remedy it was to build a bale fire or bone fire to uh, not only smoke the terrible vites away, get rid of the verms, but also to purify the water. So mm. that's just boiling water, you know. Mm. If you go to a well and it's warm enough that the well has now um, had a, a bunch of water sitting on the top of it that is warmed up, it's warm enough for bacterial or algae growth and frothing I mean, if you see a bunch of bubbles on what's supposed to be just water, you probably know something's growing in it, right? Mm. And so the way to fix that and make it drinkable or safe again is to boil it. So we've got these um, ritualistic actions and forms that go along with very practical solutions. And I think it's neat that, you know, there's all of this... Mm, spiritual, magical, metaphysical understanding of what is happening, in addition to the practical, don't drink frothy water. <laughs> you know, mm. uh, don't make yourself mm. sick. And when they saw the frothing water, they they considered it to be the dragons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Doing naughty things in the water. Yeah. Um. Here's one I like. This I say that these whites fly in the wind, swim in the water, and walk on the land. However, in the sky they are lusty, as oft happens, spilling their seed into wells and into river waters, which in the next year grows deadly. To this such a remedy may be found, that is to say, a bale fire of bones was set up, and the smoke of which drives these bites away. So this mm. was... Um, 14th or 15th century that they were writing about that as old lore mm. so that was quite some quite some time this was all carried on but they would build um bale fires uh near the rivers or near the wells and smoke everything out which would also you know practically drive out mosquitoes and mm. other insects and bugs that were uh, mating and or reproducing in that kind of muck or frothy waters. Mm. 
And it wasn't just the, the necessarily <laughs> sacred wells that they attacked or the holy wells. Of course, what source of fresh water is not holy, right? Um, mm. But, you know, it could be anything. It would be like a blight upon the land where they crossed over. So any kinds of water sources. Dragons would be an interesting topic to talk about at some stage. Yep. Um, the wooden hoops uh, mm. were thrown into the air. So you'd, you'd get a wooden hoop and you'd drill a bunch of holes around the outside so you could catch it with a crooked stick and throw it into the air while it was burning. And then it would drive the dragons away, the worms would drive away because okay. you're throwing these giant burning hoops into the air. I thought the uh, the fiery wheels were simply for the uh, representation of jumping over for the crops, the height of the crops. We've rolled fiery wheels down the hills. We've had a few, um, you know, young uh, teenagers who didn't believe in mortality yet uh, throw <laughs> some some flaming wheels up into the air. Uh, at some of our festivals, but we've never jumped over them. Um, mm. We've jumped the fire at Beltane. That's sometimes. the actual Beltane. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, fire, 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 fire. Mm. Um, we like fire. Fire's cool. We can do all daring things with fire. Like jump over it and let it catch your pants alive. <laughs> um let's see here's one as late as the 18th century about midsummer's eve on the vigil of saint john the baptist's nativity they make bonfires and run along the streets and fields with whiffs of straw blazing on long poles to purify the air which they think infectious by believing all the devil's spirits ghosts and hobgoblins fly abroad this night to hurt mankind that is from what is that from all i wrote was 18th was like, century ireland ah handy <laughs> wasn't bead was it bead was bead that late i thought bead was earlier than that i don't think that was bead not sure uh yeah, caleb said, said ancient sparklers ancient sparklers <laughs> Well, yeah, um, but also smoking. Um, all of the fires here produce a lot of smoke. And so, you know, using the smoke to purify the air, to drive out sickness, that sort of thing. Um, both solstices are sick times. This is, there's summer cold season and winter cold season, and they're both due to extremes in temperature for a lot of people um, that help lower their immune system. And so people are more likely to get sick or the body's more likely to be stressed and have other conditions come out. So there's lots of illness protection, uh, purification type stuff that go with these two seasons leading up to midsummer and leading up to yule and i guess yeah, afterwards you're just too tired to care <laughs> <laughs> and i suppose I suppose midsummer being it's not actually the hottest time but i mean it's midsummer um but that would be mostly when bacteria is growing yeah from the heat yeah well if you would have an environmental change that's enough to change the surface of standing water mm. you know um our hottest time here is after midsummer. It's it's pretty much near Lamas when we get mm. the heat waves. But it's enough that like lakes get warmer and we have algae blooms and all sorts of things because the water temperature goes up. There have been a couple of years where we've had some of the smaller lakes. We've had large fish die offs because the water temperature went up too high and they couldn't get down deep enough to stay away from that so mm. you know that that's a bad sign when all of a sudden there's tons of dead fish just the next morning you talk about mm. illness across the land it's disturbing even if you know scientifically what's going on and why 
it's still deeply unsettling. And if that's your food source, that's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. Especially coming out after midsummer, because that's when you start need to start uh, putting all those food sources away, ready for winter. Yeah, that's into the harvest where it's it's time to be packing everything away as long as possible. Um, mm. One of the interesting thing that shows up in the midsummer lore again and again is the illnesses that are sown by the worms are year long illnesses they are not brief little things they are deep illnesses that will come to be in quite some time which mirrors yule ideas about the oaths for the new year and the plans for the new year and all of the all of that sort of stuff it's a long-term point where you're standing and looking out over a long span of the future and midsummer is concerned very much with the coming decline, um, the mm. illnesses, those who are going to die, that sort of thing. Um, you worry a lot about your cows and you worry a lot about your kids at this time of year and your elderly because they're the ones in the most danger of all mm. of these illnesses that are going to happen, that are going to come probably manifesting at the end of harvest when all of that work is done and there has been that that physical toil it was the sicknesses sown back at midsummer mm -hmm. yeah caleb said it, it happened in her part of the midwest uh beaches are covered with fish mm -hmm. yeah. and notably all of this is about fresh water none of this is about the ocean Mm. All of this, uh, body's too big. yeah, this frothing, the worry about the holy wells, the blessings from the holy wells, all of this is concerned with freshwater sources, very inland stuff, because I would imagine the ocean is not terribly affected by such things. The ocean is much more connected to the moon and the tides and, and that sort of thing. And it's a whole different type of water. Yeah, it's also a very a larger body, plus it's always constantly moving. Mm -hmm. Whereas inland, it doesn't move as much. And uh, ocean die-offs, when we suddenly see a whole bunch of fish or animals dead, washed up on the shore, are not predictable by the season because they're due to other other circumstances. They are often predictable due to tides, but... Mm -hmm. They're not connected to summer or winter or things like that. Hmm. All right, should we move on to Yule? Mm -hmm. Most 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 people's favorite time of year. Sorry, I'm just last bit of the notes on Midsummer to make sure I didn't miss anything because, of course, I didn't. I didn't do the proper thing and make myself a bullet point list. I was just like, <gasps> it's in the no big book. bullet point. Just look <sighs> through the big book. It's in the big book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Yule. There's Yule Manoth is huge. Um, <laughs> this is the season of holidays. Holy crap all the holidays um so um before we go too far into it i will reference some other youtube channels uh ocean keltoy has put out some of course excellent heathen research he's uh, got a heathen focused channel and he just put out two videos in the last week or two uh, with some very good research into the history of yule there and i will Get my mouse link. back uh, and drop some links here. If uh, yeah. so I'll, I'll try and search for them while you're window, window, window. Do the proper window. There we go. Um, are are the links showing up in the chat? Not yet. And then linguistic 
We've also got uh, Dr. Jackson Crawford. He's got a good video on Yule. Okay. If those don't um, show up. It's Ocean Cultoy, Find a Way or Make One. Is that the one? That's his, yeah, that's his channel. Okay. Let me just go back to the channel link and I'll just put it in the chat just in case. Oh, I copied okay. a timestamp in there. There's no reason for that. Okay, there's Ocean Council. The other one was? Dr. Jackson Crawford. Okay. Safety and links and such like in YouTube. So, um, just references if you're interested in the heathen side of things. That's uh, what I do. And they're very good videos, so I won't duplicate all of their research here. Uh, is Jackson Crawford often wearing a, a, a cowboy, cowboy hat. hat? Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's the one. Just have to check that. Um, here we go. Link. There we go. So, um, actually, we'll go pop these into our uh, Discord too. Well, what's up? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Yule. There's lots and lots of traditions of Yule. Um, let's start with traditional witchcraft stuff. Um, Yule is the time out of time, the turning point of the year, the um, point where everything is dark and underground and now emerges and yeah, it's very come out, come out of hibernation isn't it mm -hmm. um in the cycle of the white queen this is where she shows up as all of her cells complete in the triplicity and the uh changing uh son of light and father of death he's not there because he's in the other world. He entered the underworld at Samhain and he doesn't get back until Tuanmas. So this is a time where there is no king, there is no god, there is no um, male divinity presence because he's off doing other things. Um, other times, um, the maiden mother he's prone no, he's at the pub. He's at the pub. He's at the yes. dead people pub. <laughs> <laughs> the the before and the will be. <laughs> so this is a limbo time, a moving time. And uh, just like we had at the wild or at the wild hunt at Halamos, um, Samhain, we have the wild hunt here also all of the traditions of, of that um in uh nordic and scandinavian lore we've got like the krampus traditions krampus knocked is back on december 5th that night december 6th mm -hmm. and that's like a parade of spirits very noisy very loud lots of clanging bells as, as the krampuses come through but it's similar in idea to um, the ideas of the wild hunt, the spirits parading through, and our um, not mimicry in a jack sense, but um, in a, a line with the tide sense that we have at Hallow Moss and as part of Yule traditions. Um, there's there other. Is a lot of, there is a lot of mimicking and, and uh, foolery, isn't there? Yeah, Yule goes along with, I mean, we have the Jack Frost. It is the, the time of misrule. Jack comes mm. from the same roots as Jester and means something like a trickster. Um, you know, where fool is king for the day kind of stuff. And that might go with ideas about seasonal observances for winter is tricky. Mm. It might go with um, all of that santa shaman mushroom amanita lore we have 
about turning the world upside down and why reindeer fly because they like the mushrooms more than the humans do. <laughs> uh, reindeer like Amanitas so much they will dig in the snow like dig dig in the snow and move trees and branches to eat them they they like the mushrooms and of course once the reindeer have safely processed all the dangerous parts of the Amanita they produce a golden elixir that humans can have um, that allows us to experience the Amanita without the chance of dying so the reindeer let us fly, as they say. Mm -hmm. So we've got all of that kind of idea. Um, now, some cycles do have the rebirth of the Sun King at this time of year. Um, sometimes it's the uh, fully formed child of light. Sometimes that waits until Tuan Moss, um, and it's the hand of the maiden that passes over the cauldron and manifests the physical form. And during Yule, we have the wraith form, uh, the parthogenesis from the dark mother. Uh, the queen of fate brings forth the wraith, the first imprint of the son of light, who, because of that birthing, becomes the child of promise because he's not actually here yet. So there's that cycle, that part of the Yule cycle. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's anything sure. else here. Go ahead. Caleb said he's imbibing in spirits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes there is a four Yule intercalary month here, just like there's a little uh, intercalary month. Um, around St. John's Eve or summer solstice that is just a few nights. Um, and that tradition is also Mother's Night or Modra Night or Modra Nicht. Um, we keep Mother's Night here the night before solstice day, the longest night. Uh, there's some few uh, attestations in the lore that that's what they did. Not a lot. There's attestations for other things too. I'm sure our ancestors did things the way we do and uh, scheduled it as close as they thought was right, but in alignment with their lives. In modern times, um, lots of kindreds here pick Saturday night closest before because, you know, if you're going to stay up all night, and you got to work at 8 in the morning. Life mm. goes on. We have to do the best we can. Um, but for a lot of us, it's important to keep a vigil on the night before solstice morning. And there's a lot of different traditions and taboos that go with that longest night. Um, some of our traditions are that only mothers keep that vigil. Uh, mother is a job. And so only people who fulfilled that job um, can do that sort of thing because it's kind of midwifing the new child into existence. Um, some are just that one person needs to keep the vigil. Um, we have been part of a tradition where the warden is responsible for that vigil. And if he or she doesn't keep it, then they, they kind of magically deputize someone to um they pass on their office for that night so it's always the warden mm. so you know that implies that protection that is needed for that process and of course if you can stay up and party cool um many of us like to keep you know our our true pagan party roots going <laughs> as much as we can uh but <laughs> you know uh, when we had a coven that had a bunch of families with little kids in it, we would always have a big Mother's Night party. And sure enough, by, um, you know, three or four in the morning, the kids would be asleep. And there'd be us adults sitting around in that altered state of being sleep deprived, <laughs> carefully divining into our coffee cups. <laughs> <laughs> when in the world the sun was finally going to come up so we could sleep you know 
<laughs> Got to keep the vigil, though. Yeah. Um, we also uh, had. Inf- oh, go ahead. Infinite Dragon God has joined us. Hello, how are you? Hello. Uh, and also said you know about Cal- uh, Ocean Keltoi. We know lots of things. And lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, solstice morning, uh, especially when my kids were little. Uh, we usually would go outside at the first break of the sun across the horizon. So um, I'd stay up all night, wake everybody up when it started to get light. And then we would all go outside and face east and watch for the first sliver of sun we could see. And then great noisiness, um, probably to the consternation of our neighbors every year, but banging pots and pans (laughs) and making a huge clatter and screaming and yelling in joy that the sun was up. Mm -hmm. And then I always went to sleep and passed the children off to an adult that had slept the night through. (laughs) That would now make breakfast. (laughs) And the neighbors are going, oh, those bloody pagans. Right? Those pagans. (laughs) Oh, bloody pagans. Um, Just like we did um, uh, a maying and did May Day baskets for Beltane because we always made a holy hell of noise (laughs) on Beltane too. (laughs) Um, you know, we we distribute fruit baskets and such to our neighbors is kind of an apology that you have to live near the really rowdy pagans. We did the same mm-hmm. thing solstice mornings. <laughs> After all of the clanging and yelling and and uh, a braying, the uh, kids would be given little baskets to leave on people's doorsteps. And usually mm-hmm. we filled them with nuts and fruit and then always made sure that they were covered. And... Um, covered with something red. Uh, uh, I often let the kids take red tissue paper and put big white dots on them so they looked like little mushrooms in the baskets because I thought that was super cute. That's totally UPG. Um, (laughs) But, um, you know, we got to live in harmony with our neighbors. Mm. Kind of. Might as well give them some gifts. Might as well. And then make shitloads of noise, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I find that, that gift giving is a very good pagan tradition to keep up especially when your house is the coven stead <laughs> it involves all of the the loud the gift, the gift given is just to appease the other people <laughs> well yeah yeah always think about mm. the the gifts we give to the the land vites and um the appeasement like we're going to be tromping around on your land sorry <laughs> the same thing with the neighbors you know Sorry, mm. here we go. Um, uh, do you want to take a quick break? Oh, sure. Oh, we've gotten to that time. Has your yeah, hot chocolate gotten well? It has, <laughs> and I think uh, Yule's going to carry on for quite a while. So let's take a quick break and we'll come yeah. back with more Yule. Yule, Yule, um, Yule. So we're going to go away for just a little bit. We'll be back. Um, in the meantime, let us know how you celebrate and what you're celebrating and where you are in the world. Mm-hmm. Because, you know can't be the only one here in the southern hemisphere all right then we will be back just now all righty have a good one yes
welcome back to the Blackout Chat. So today we are talking about the solstices and we're going to continue with Yule. Yule. And Caleb said I'll be celebrating a new friends mass at the very least with some old friends and new drinking, gift exchange and some board games should be a good time. Actually, I just I actually want to mention that quickly because in the Southern Hemisphere, we get this question a lot. What do we do at Christmas time? Because it's in the middle because, of summer. Because it's in the middle of summer. Yeah. You know, so we celebrate midsummer, but then all friends and family who are Christian are celebrating Christmas. Um, do you both? I mean, I'm my 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 sister's up uh, in, in Joburg at the moment, and it's my my great niece's first Christmas. So tomorrow we are doing Christmas Day for her. <laughs> <laughs> And then Sunday, we're doing Midsummer. <laughs> Why the fuck not? Yeah, yeah. We usually uh, slot uh, Christmas activities for Christian family into our Yule schedule. Because, I mean, mm. so many holidays this time of year. So many holidays to keep. And yeah. board games are definitely a, a Yule tradition stretching back into pagan times games games and fire and eating and drinking <laughs> like mm -hmm. those are the things you do when you get together with people and they have been part of pagan celebrations for hundreds and hundreds of years well also i mean around around uh midwinter it's a time when you want to stay inside and keep warm so mm. games are a good thing to do yeah yeah and there's the divination aspect at these turning tides when we're looking to a new year coming there are many games that are used as forms of divination um mm. you know you might play very very old games that have those divination aspects to it or you might be goofy like my family and play monopoly and see who's going to have the most prosperous year by who makes the most money in monopoly you know <laughs> you can do whatever you want with it um you can have a good time with it so but mm. games just for the fun of it um but also you know it is interesting to see how we can apply them to the older worldviews and the older ideas uh, that our ancestors probably had we don't know for sure mm. there's, there's actually also the aspect of new year i mean um, you know, after after uh, midwinter comes a new year in mm -hmm. where you are. Yeah, for, for many people. So, I mean, here, midsummer, I mean, we could also bring those aspects into it and, and also continue or make that our new year as well. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of... Rather than the midwinter aspect. There are several um, European traditions that would connect to uh traditional witchcraft that could put a new year right after midsummer for the same reasons mm -hmm. because now it's the decline time it's the change over time this is the solstices are that mark of that change so you know mm -hmm. there's there's totally logical justification and um ways you could interpret historical precedent to logically put the new year after midsummer if that's mm. what you want to do yeah so all those board games and divination can actually be entered into midsummer in the southern hemisphere mm -hmm. as aspects of the new year yeah. yep. yep you gotta you gotta find your own way um mm. modern times call for modern solutions so because mm. I, I think that that's the some people's problem you know they they hear and they read about certain traditions and certain practices that happen at a particular time and you mm -hmm. have to stick to those things you have to stick make sure that you keep them at those those times but i mean it's you know when we're all over the world it uh it becomes a bit of a, a mix and match a little bit yeah and and reckoning like reckoning of when things happen is one of the most hotly debated things and mm. i have used a variety of reckoning systems over the years and 
they all work and they all don't work. You know, they have their, their pluses and minuses. It just depends on what I'm focusing on and what I'm doing. Sometimes I like to go by the astrology. Sometimes I like astronomy where we have to actually sight the thing. A lot of times I enjoy, you know, the plant cycle. Um, spring starts when the first crocus blooms. You know, mm. fall is when the leaves fall off the tree. You know, so it it depends on what feels right to you, what works for you, um, where um, where you are in relation with your community. And, you know, despite, I, I went through several years of fuck the Gregorian calendar and all their crazy reckoning, but I still have to live in a world that uses that date system. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, many of us celebrate Christmas with our even sometimes nominally Christian families, but we have family, we have friends that have other holidays than we do, you know, that might not align with where we are on our calendar. So there's, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff to take into consideration. All that to say, um, you're not wrong if you're doing it on a different day. Mm. Yeah, it's just what you bring into it. Yeah, as long as you're, as long as you're considering it. Yeah. All right. I think Infinite Dragon God really, really, really wants to know if, if Santa Claus is Odin. <laughs> well, it's not a simple question. No. <laughs> <laughs> just like anything with cultural anything. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, Nordic and Scandinavian practices definitely have influence from the myths of Odin into Santa Claus. Santa Claus has lots of other influences too, uh, in addition to Odin. It's not like some single direct line. For many There's modern- a lot, of, a lot of myths too. Yeah. For many modern practitioners, Santa Claus can be Odin. And, and that's it. That's fine if that's the way you want to celebrate. Um, there's influence, there's connections. Um, heathen mythology uh, has a lot of significance with Yule and the way Yule is celebrated and the way things are done. One of the terms for the gods is Yulnir, which means Yule beings, Yule people. So mm -hmm. all the gods are intimately connected with Yule, which is probably the biggest holiday in heathen worldview, continental heathen, mostly Icelandic and Germanic influenced. Um, the, the justification that um, the All Father, the Yule Father brings gifts on an eight-legged horse, um, at this time of year and that's why he's santa it makes a lot of sense it's probably much more complex than that but um leaving treats out for schlipner uh, feeding the horses this time of year that's a, an old tradition um we've got the idea of the um medicine people uh especially in very very northern climes that the snow would be so high this time of year that to deliver the presence of the dried um, amanitas, they'd have to climb over the snow and go in through the smoke hole because you couldn't get in the door. And hence, Santa coming down the chimney. Uh, there's that connection. Uh, the idea that he dresses in red and white fur. Um, some people point to St. Nicholas, who gave gifts to the poor and, and took care of children this time of year who dressed in red and white as the source for that, but also the connection with the Amanita mushroom and the connections with the uh, shamans from those tribes that their uh, ritual uh, gear was red and trimmed in white fur. So, you know, there's, it's not so completely, it collective. yeah, it's not completely made up speculations that there is a connection here. But it's also not like 
a very direct line where we can be like this, 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 because it's culture. It, you know, people mm -hmm. are going to adapt the beliefs and the practices and the ideas around them everywhere you go, you know, and everything's just a little different. It's tweaked a little different. My community has the hog father, which is like straight out of Terry Pratchett. <laughs> and Terry Pratchett based the hog father on lots of lore about Odin and Santa Claus and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, we can't, there's not historical um, pre Terry Pratchett's lifetime sources for the Hogfather. Uh, but, you know, there's oathing on a boar because it is sacred to Freyr, who, even though he's a harvest god, like we associate him with, um, you know, the growing wheat and, and the fields and, and that sort of thing, there's still connections to Yule and to the Yule Ose and to the promise of a new harvest, the the blessing of the seed for the next year, which, you know, also happens at the Charming of the Plow uh, or Tuan Moss at the end of winter, the end of the cold time, halfway into summer, depending upon how you reckon. This is all getting very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Santa Claus is one of those mythological figures. And as you said, it is a collective. It's a collection of different myths from all different places. Um, so I think as, as the centuries went by, somebody said, oh, that one looks good. Let's put it into the, uh, into the Santa Claus myth as well. And it just developed and developed and developed. It's snowballed. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you could say Santa Claus is a universal myth in a way. Um, but I think to say or to ask if it has, if Santa Claus has pagan origins, um, depends how you consider pagan. Because um, I think it probably. P bits and pieces probably come from all over the world and from all different time periods. Yeah, definitely different time periods. So mm. we get this debate a lot when we start talking about pagan traditions, and it seems Yule brings this up a lot. Christian stole Yule and made it Christmas and, you know, that sort of thing. And the thing is, pagan traditions and Christian traditions existed alongside one another for hundreds of years. We know 100% that happened. And cultural interchange absolutely happened. Uh, it was happening at court king level. It was definitely happening at all the other levels of society. So we can't really say that one tradition stole something from another or that it was 100% rooted in this. We can go back and point to things that were around before Christianity was around, sure. We have some evidence for those sorts of things, but, you know, this is people living their lives and keeping traditions alive, and traditions morph as they get passed through the generations, and the next generation might be a different religion or might have different ideas about what these things mean. We pass these on to our children because they're the values that we want to pass on. So we run up against this in traditional witchcraft too, because there's a bunch of biblical stuff in traditional witchcraft. There's a mm. Gregory and all of the lore about Tubal Cain and all of this stuff that's in there. And sometimes we want to try, yeah, we want to try to disentangle those threads and find out which one's truly pagan and which one's truly Christian. And I don't think there are absolute concrete answers to those anymore. Here and there, there are some traditions you can find that are unique. Um, mm. But there's been so much time and so much interchange and so much blending that it's very, very hard to tease them apart. That doesn't mean don't look because there's fascinating, fascinating things to find in there. But let go of the idea that there is a one right, true answer for how it absolutely happened. 
that could be applied across the board because it can't. What happened in this area is different than what happened in this area is different than what happened in this area. And then you've got to consider all of the time and everything else. And just because this area was predominantly Christian doesn't mean there was like some families that still did pagan things. And this area was predominantly pagan. And, you know, somebody's sister-in-law is from the Christian stuff and came and sat at the bloat and was like, no, Christ, I'll raise the horn to Christ. We have, you know, sagas that talk about that. So that had to have been happening all over everywhere as people mixed together and had families and traditions. And that's just two possible strands. There's lots and lots of other cultures rising and falling the world over and borders and people crossing borders and changing families and changing traditions. You know, and then we've got, like, all of the influence of the Greek and Roman practices on Yule. we got Mithraism and all of that sort of stuff and Saturnalia and all of those celebrations and how that all ties in to what we now think of as Christmas and Yule. So, and Pagan is a huge umbrella. Um, generally we think we mean Northern European pre-Christian indigenous practices, uh, but that's still a huge umbrella too. So it depends how you interpret pagan, whether it's the religious aspects or just being country dwellers. Yeah. So it's con if it's country dwellers, a lot of Christians at that time were country dwellers as well. Right. So that could also be considered pagan in a sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got like, the the whole argument about Christ being born on December 25th, and he wasn't because it was winter time. And uh, I read an argument the other day that he was born on the December 25th because he was conceived on March 25th, which was the day of Annunciation, which is actually the day that um, Archangel Javriel announced to Mary that she would carry the Son of God. But then there was, a, there was another argument Somebody actually stated that Christ was born on the 17th of June, 2 BC, which was a conjunction of Jupiter and Venus, which caught the attention of the wise men, mm -hmm. uh, and born on 6th April, 1st B, uh, 1 BC. Um, but then they changed, the, the Roman Catholic Church changed the date to December 25th, because that was the birthday of uh, Mithra. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that was Rome, that was the Roman god, that was Mithraism. So the integration of that with Rome, with the Christ, well, Roman Catholic Church and everything else. So you've got all these things that, that keep popping up and people arguing about, oh no, this is the truth, this is, these are the facts. It was all integrated at some stage. Well, and you know? to a certain degree, that matters. We should know our history as best mm. we can. And I mean, history is written by the victors, so there's a lot of things we don't get to know. But it does come down to why are you arguing about this? Mm. Why do you need to be right? And what does right really mean? And especially, I see it online when people are like, no, no, you're wrong. This is the right way to do this. And I, there are some wrong ways to do witchcraft. Absolutely. And there are some things that like need to be shut down because they're abusive and they're unsafe. But what day you celebrate a holiday on is not one of those things. You know, mm. how you manage those family traditions is not one of those things unless it's abusive and dangerous. But, you know, there's not a right, a singular right way that is the singular truth that trumps everything else. And you can argue that other people must be part of that singular truth because it's the one you found. Doesn't work that way. Mm. You know, we have to find the ways that work for each of us and the things that make sense. And that's going to change over time. That's going to change over the course of your practice. So, yeah. and it all depends on 
family and who you're practicing with too. Yeah, a lot of it's symbolic as well. I mean, the years back, um, reading about the uh, Roman Catholic Church around about 300 something AD, they decided to change the the birth date of Christ to the 25th of December um, because it was Mithra's birthday and Mithra is uh, a sun god and Christ represented the sun. Yeah, and I've... he was the son of God, etc., etc., etc. So it all became symbolic anyway. I've read some stuff that that was a theological justification, but it was actually a political move because the Mithraean cult was getting out of hand and the Roman government could not control it. Mm. And so they were supporting the Christian cult at the time and were do making these political moves to make sure that they could remain in control of the government and, and the people and so on and so forth. And that sounds kind of sinister to say it that way. But, um, you know, there's tons and tons of history, tons and tons of history there about what was going on. And there are people who interpret um, many of the things in the Bible as literal and people who read it metaphorically as a skaldic tradition and mm, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. All right, let's get back to Yule. So, <laughs> um, how long does Yule last? So, uh, my tradition, we keep the 12 days of Yule, even though that is probably definitely from the 12 days of Christmas, from December 25th to uh, La Bifana. What do they call it in Christianity? I can't remember, it's the 5th of January usually. The 6th of January. Um, anyways, 12 days. Um, mm -hmm. We keep it from the 20th, uh, the day before solstice, which we reckon is Mother's Night, to New Year's Eve. And then we celebrate Hogmanay on the 1st. And uh, we celebrate the La Bifana tradition, which is Italian, not heathen, on the 6th. So we, we do all sorts of all sorts of things in there. Lots and lots of things. But historically, Yule probably lasted as long as the ale lasted. The party goes till the keg is empty. Um, and Good so timing. that kind of depended on how um, excited your mead makers were <laughs> in the harvest season before winter. So, mm -hmm. you know, three days, 12 days, 20 days, an entire month. I mean, we have Yule Monath, the whole month of Yule, that entire moon season, if you want to reckon it that way. Um, some I've heard are as long as the Yule log burns. And just practically speaking, I think that's kind of a romantic idea. Because, I don't know, bonfires burn hot and fast and they'll eat a lot of wood. Like, yeah. fast. And then I've also... Say the us the usual ahead. tradition of the Yule log is when it burns, just you just keep it burning overnight. So you keep that vigil. Yeah, that's uh, and if if it's going still going on in the next morning, then it's just a good omen. But it's, as long as I've heard it, yeah. I've heard this tradition um, in modern times, and I've even seen some people do it. And I just I can't wrap my head around it that our ancestors were doing this. And this is where they burned like a giant tree as the Yule log. And like they just slowly fed this entire chunk of the tree into the fire. And it was so mm. freaking big, it was like sticking outside, you know, because our ancestors were like uh, importing giant trees. I mean, Iceland is famous for its forests, right? Um, mm. You know, if you're lost in Icelandic forests, just stand up. Uh, so, but I don't know if you've ever been in a cold winter where it's blowing like crazy outside and it's near white out conditions, I would not allow as the keeper of the house to have the doors propped open with the tree sticking out. No. Um, <laughs> it just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, all the mm. heat you're generating to keep your hole warm would be going right out those doors. Mm. You know. I also read about that where they, you know, the whole family, several several members of the family have to carry the Yule log into the house and then put it in the fire. And I'm thinking, how big was the fucking fireplace? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, mm, I don't know. I think practicality wins. 
Um, <laughs> I can definitely see the party lasts as long as the ale lasts, but I, it doesn't make sense that the party lasts as long as the tree burns. Mm. Um, but, you know, there are traditions about the overnight vigil. Um, there are traditions that involve keeping the ash of the fires from one year to the next, or keeping the Yule log from one year to the next. I know modern pagans that take the trunk of their Yule tree and use that to make next year's Yule log to mm -hmm. carry that through. Um, there are lots and lots of ways for all of the holidays that are annual that we tie these um, years together for a continuity. So we do something mm -hmm. from last year at this time to prepare for next year and stitch everything together through time. And, you know, wood's easy to keep. So, and then there are like, um, there are traditions that use the same Yule log uh, many, many, many years ago um, before finding heathenry our Yule log was the same log every year. We put new evergreen boughs on it and new candles in it, but it was the same piece of wood. We didn't burn the wood. We put candles on it and uh, burned the candles on top of the Yule log. So, you know, how that tradition works and, and where you want to make those connections, how you want to make those connections, it's up to you and up mm. to your practices. We had a kindred that was part of our community that would always collect ash from the fires we held in ceremony and carry those ashes and add them to the next fire in ceremony throughout the year and all throughout the continent. And then, you know, at the big, the last one of the season at, at winter nights before we all stayed home for the winter, um, they would collect these ashes and distribute them to various kindreds and then we would all put them in our Yule fire. And then mm. at the first um, gathering at um, Ostara, you know, when the snows had just broken, we'd all bring our Yule fire ashes and put those together. So is, is that historical? No idea. Probably not. But it was Yule a really nice way to, to move everything together and be connected to our community. Um, because some uh, people have Yule traditions that involve lots of visiting and lots of gathering with other people. Uh, some people have, uh, you know, this is kindred time only, coven time only. Um, we don't add other people to our celebrations, at least our religious celebrations. So it depends on your tradition and what you're doing with your family and your people. Mm. Uh, Caleb said, my Hellenistic uh, tradition celebrates 12 days of Dionysus, beginning on the 24th. Lots of traditions with 12 days. Mm -hmm. yeah, Lots of traditions. Carried on from one to the other. Yeah. And 12 probably comes from long, long, long ago. Like long, long, long ago. Our timekeeping system was base 12. Not 10. And not 7. That's why we have 24 mm. hours in a day. That's why there's 360 degrees in a circle. Um those sorts of calculations that are base 12 and so a whole unit would be 12 days a complete cycle and that's mm -hmm. also probably connected to those macro uh, micro levels the idea that you act out the whole coming year in this complete mini cycle you know mm -hmm. um we have all those ideas about first footing and taboos about spinning and you know having the work done before the celebration um, we keep lights we don't use a fire anymore we use little electric battery powered candles because practically that's what we need to do but we keep lights burning in our um, fireplace in our hearth for those 12 days as a form of protection and each day represents one of the coming months and so we pay attention to the omens that happen on each of those days for what's going to happen in those next 12 months. You know, and I have 12 little candles and each day there's a new offering to each candle for prosperity and health in whatever that month is. So, mm. you know, there's lots of different ways to put that together. 
and to incorporate magic into your holiday traditions. Um, yeah, I was, was going to say we could, you could do a, a divination each day for each month, each mm-hmm. coming month. But I was just thinking I might need to do, I might need to uh, do a 12 months of midsummer <laughs> or 12 days of midsummer. Yeah. Um, mm. I know there are some people that uh, have a meditation that goes with each of the 12 days that is about a value or, you know, a piece of the Eddas to meditate on and that sort of thing. Um, there's also sun weight, which is a modern tradition that a lot of heathens keep that happens leading up to Yule that lights a candle each week. Um, and they're connected with the first six runes, the Futhark, and traditions that go along with that and ideas and meditations and prayers that go along with that, that build up to it. Just like, um, Christians have the adverse, no, that's not it. Advent calendar that counts down. You get chocolate every day. I don't really know what that's about, but I'm sure it has an actual spiritual import in Christianity. (laughs) I just know it was great for kids. I used to love my advent calendars. <laughs> <laughs> all I know is the jokes about people who are like, yes, it's the 24th now because I've eaten all the chocolate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, stuffing stockings. Uh, all of the connections with leaving treats for the reindeer or um, leaving treats for Schlepnir or um, the horses, whatever. Uh, animal conveyance your uh, Santa figure uses, your gift-giving figure, and sometimes the treats go in the stockings, Uh, sometimes they go in boots, that's very common. Um, The Schlepnir candy that happens the night after Krampus visits is a burgeoning common tradition among heathen children. Where they leave out one of their shoes with treats by it and the next morning it's the shoe is full of candy um or sometimes coal so there's a lot of these yule traditions where um you get good or you get bad <laughs> you can get candy and fruit and toys or you can get coal or <laughs> something else terrible um i've even mm-hmm. heard of one where uh, supposedly the reindeer shits in your shoe if you've been a bad kid <laughs> so i don't know i don't know how uh, the parents made that one happen overnight where the kids were asleep but uh (laughs) there is also um the protection from the wild hunt with those same ideas leaving the treats out for the horses of the wild hunt so that the horses would be happy and not pick you out to be um terrorized for that time Mm -hmm um wasn't that, wasn't that also for the i think in scandinavian law it was the tromty um the tompton the the, the tompton trough i'm sure i'm sure i read tromty anyway the but the fey basically the mm-hmm. the misrule mm. um so you you leave out the gifts in order to appease them as well yeah and the neighbors there's the 13 yeah. icelandic yule lads that one comes mm. each night and and they're um, they're mischief makers like spoon liquor and door slammer and window liquor, like that makes frost on windows. I don't remember all the translations of the names. We we did that a couple of imagine years. This, imagine this little fake and with his tongue getting stuck on the glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a tradition. Oh man, it's got to be Scandinavian somewhere. I shoot i don't remember i haven't done it in years that you think whatever fiber craft before um the uh, mother's night and then you put it out on the snow and the goddess comes by and blesses your work and then you can bring it in uh wet with the fresh snow and then you um have your your blessed holy shawl or Uh, hank or whatever it is for the year um the way i practice it that was mother holda but i'm pretty sure that's because mother holda herkta berkta are all um huge factors in my personal practice and i'm 
I'm not sure of the goddess or the region or the time period for that practice, so maybe I shouldn't have brought it up because that's a terrible citation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I follow December spinning taboos. So from the 1st of December, or really I do um, the full moon just before the 1st of December, I have a sacred project, um, spinning or knitting usually, that I work on up until Mother's Night. And it's got to be completed in that time. It's got to be started at the full moon and finished on Mother's Night. And then that is sacrificed at sometime during the 12 days of Yule, whenever we have our sacrifice uh, bloat for that time as um, holy work dedicated to the mother goddess. Um, so there are taboos like that. Um, trying to think of other things. Uh, we talked a little bit about Os, um, the uh, ancient Os that were taken at Yule, and we only have one attestation of them in one saga. But there's a lot of belief that those are probably connected to our now practice of New Year's resolutions. Mm. Because this is a liminal time. This is the, the prep before, you know, the crossover into the new threshold. And the oath in Sumble or in Bloat was that promise for an entire year there with all of the Yulnir, all of the ancestors. You know, this is, this is the big... Big, 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 big bloat where everybody's there. All the gods, all the ancestors, all the everyone. Big potluck, mm -hmm. big party. And so it's the time to make those those year-long oaths and promises for the new year. Um, not everybody would celebrate Mother's Night, do they? Because some, when it comes to 12 nights, I know that some people start that on um, Yule itself. Yeah. And it finishes on the 1st of Jan. Yep. Yeah. And so a little bit of a bit of a shift there. Some people start do. earlier. Some people put Mother's Night at a different time. Um, mm. You know, that's our reckoning, and it's our reckoning in a modern time too. It, our our choice of where those things go and how those twelve days work is based on a modern calendar, and you know, people have to work less during that time because of the Christian holidays that sort of thing too mm. and you know our our modern yule traditions are things like we all pile into uh, somebody's minivan one night and make popcorn and go look at christmas lights because we we um see that our community the people around us are returning the light and celebrating mm. the return of the sun and that sort of thing and and we sing stupid songs and yell and scream in the car and <laughs> you know is that um, historically accurate? Is it super fun? And the, and, the, and the neighbors are all standing there again going, those bloody pagans. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do I do a lot of um, neighborly appeasement throughout the year to make up for the fact that I, I'm a pagan really? priest and um, <laughs> things can get kind of rowdy around here. And I do some weird things. Um, every time we have new neighbors move into the neighborhood, there's there's one point where sure enough they're on their porch on some nice beautiful night and I'm out there at midnight standing in front of a tree with a bowl of fruit and a horn of mead talking to the moon and pouring things out and I'm just like hi <laughs> doing things <laughs> yep um the tradition of gift giving um what I find interesting is that you know, if we if we go back to much older times, I mean, the the winter period was when people basically hibernated. So they would go to bed as early as possible so that they could re, uh, re, preserve the, the lighting for the rest of the winter and then wake up as late as possible. Um, but during that period, they are going through their stores and eating the food that they've stored and everything else. So when it came to Yule, I would imagine that some folk would have, maybe they had something happen with, with some of their food and now they haven't got enough to get through. So that whole gift giving period would be where the community came together and helped each other out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, if, if one person had a bit more and they didn't need it for the rest of that period and another family didn't, then, you know, they would gift that because they had more than the other. Um, I think that's been lost a lot. Um, you know, it, it was more about supporting the community, giving back to the community where you could. Well, in gifting societies, and I highly suggest everybody reads The Gift by Marcel Mauss. It's not long, um, but it's one of the best studies we have on, on gifting culture. Um, gifts were not just barter. They were bonding. They were community support. And they were the means that kept the uh, economy of the culture moving. And we mm. don't live in a gifting culture anymore. We live in a consumer culture. And so our gifting traditions are now consumer culture driven. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot of work to be part of a community that wants to develop a gifting culture because it's such an overriding fundamental piece of our worldview. And we can't exist in a wholly gifting culture now. There's nowhere to do it. So, mm -hmm. you know, finding a way to to bring those ideals back and to um, incorporate them into our gift giving is it's a lot of work but it's it's worth it and, and it's it's one of those things where we'll always be halfway up the mountain and never at the top mm, I think on a smaller scale a lot of families are actually doing volunteer work over crystal over the mm. the Yule period um, you know, going out and actually trying to give back. Um, Canada Tree Care said, uh, same here, I love my advent calendars when, when I was a kid. And I think that the shoe tradition is common in Germany. Hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go, the gift by Marcel Maus. Pick that up and read it. Never heard of <laughs> Pick that up and read it. Um, it's, it's an old, old book. So you will be able to find it all sorts of places online and find used copies for just a few dollars. So, mm. um, yeah, I've always wondered, and I've never found out why it's stocking and shoes other than that, you know, their container that hopefully everyone has. Um, but I wonder if it's somehow related to feet or to, you know, being well footed in the new year, that first footing kind of ideas. I don't know. I'm guess what I'm going to do for the rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> figure the, see if I can figure that out. Why were smelly socks used? <laughs> well, hopefully they weren't smelly. I mean, I, you see the TV might... shows where somebody pulls it off their foot and hangs it up, but surely that's yeah. not, no. <laughs> it might, might have been their old socks that they just hang up you know, ready for the, the light to come back into the new year and yeah, bring in know. their new socks. <laughs> I don't know. When I, I've been sleeping in cabins over the Yule days, I've always uh, kept my socks on. <laughs> <laughs> Cuddled up because I have chronically cold feet. <laughs> but I do keep mm. my my uh, mucklucks, my heavy rubber boots by the door because <laughs> they ain't coming in. They're filthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um all right then so how about the yule tree itself um or the christmas tree i i, I do i do recall um a tradition where people they didn't bring the tree inside it was left outside and it was lit with candles um, you know, candles in the branches and things. And if I remember correctly, the tradition was in order to keep the Fae from coming into the house um, because of the, the misrule aspect, to try and mm. keep them, you know, keep them out of the house so they wouldn't come in and, and ruin things inside the house type of thing. Um isn't there also a tradition of lighting candles in the windows? Or have I got the wrong time of year? Yeah. For the same reason. I, I've, I've never heard of the keep the fae outside of the house reason, but I mean, 
could be done. The lighting mm. candles in the windows I've always heard in connection with things like the Wild Hunt or the Soul Parade, you mm. know, to guide the dead home type of thing. Or well, maybe it was a, a similar connection where you're trying to keep the Wild Hunt away from your house. Hmm. To know. Lots and lots of traditions about the tree and mm. whether it comes in the house, whether it stays outside. Um, lots of them are, are cut conifer trees that you bring in and decorate. And then, uh, like we mentioned, sometimes they turn into the Yule log or they're burned at like Tuan Moss. Um, some of them burned in the fields because, you know, potash is kind of helpful for growing things. Um, why it's an evergreen because like that's the thing that's still green this time of year that didn't die mm. you don't want to bring a dead tree in although i've always wondered about the idea of putting candles in an evergreen tree like practically again the thing it's covered in resin it's going to go up <laughs> like a torch mm, true. you know um mm. but all the all the different ways with light and shiny objects more frequently mm. because the the shiny reflective objects most of us know that's how you keep deer out of your garden and if you want mm. to think about mischievous fae uh deer are a very logical manifestation of those <laughs> they will they will eat the things off your windows if you let them <laughs> there's something else in some areas and this is a time where they're active and all the associations with deer and winter and holidays and such like um but another thing i've heard is that the amanitas grow at the base of conifers that's they grow mm -hmm. in the that acidic uh leaf litter from conifer trees from evergreen trees and so these are kind of like the fruits of this magical tree that lives forever you know doesn't die in the winter and then has these weird little like red bright fruits that show up in the winter at the wrong time, not when everything else is fruiting. So mm. that connection too, of, as to why it is the uh, uh, Yule tree. And then there's the connection to it smokes when you burn it. These trees are all very resinous. That's part of how they survive through the cold times. And so these would all, all of these trees are, sacred trees because they have illness dispelling smoke properties mm -hmm. except of course the yew which would be illness causing smoke properties so here's this conifer that doesn't follow the rules that is actually dangerous you know and it becomes associated with the mythical and the underground and the dangerous times of year also but mm -hmm. lots and lots of lore on on evergreen trees and their use this time of year and why we put shiny things on them, why we put lights on them, why we put garlands on them, why we stick presents underneath it and lots and lots of things, lots and lots of things. Mm -hmm. Another obvious one is the um, kissing under the mistletoe, which I actually believe comes from um, fertility rituals that were done during Saturnalia in Rome. Oh. Yeah, Why the would Roman there traditions. be mistletoe in Rome? Apparently, during the Saturnalia rituals, they they performed these rituals, these fertility rituals, under boughs of mistletoe. I don't think mistletoe grows that far south. <sighs> Somebody got their history wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to the, to the druids, it was a. Uh, uh, sacred plant because it would have protect, protective um, but it's protective aspects well it's okay my UPG from because the mistletoe lore is mixed up lots and lots of it in all mm. sorts of ways and most of it doesn't make sense um, like we hear that the spear that was used to kill Baldur or the arrow that was used to kill Baldur Loki made it out of mistletoe uh, mistletoe doesn't have um, wood. <laughs> it's a squishy, I know, I, squishy plant. I read that. That that was actually in um, White Goddess, I think. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know if our Cape mistletoe is the same as English mistletoe, but I mean, it, it grows in little sections like this. Mm -hmm. well, so how you how to make a spear out of that, I couldn't yeah. figure that out. And I think that bit is actually a mistranslation. Mitzeltine is the um, the original mm, Old Norse, I guess we'll say. Um, and that means, mitzel means shit, poop. Because that's where mistletoe comes from, the poop of birds. They distribute the, the seeds, and then it grows where they've pooped on the branches. And it's a mm. parasite. It'll kill the tree that it grows on. It doesn't grow on the ground. It only grows in the trees, so on and so forth. But I think as mitzeltine, it was a kenning for shit sword, which would be a sharp tongue, i.e. shit-talking gossip killed mm -hmm. balder broad vision and hope so that's my upg of that interpretation um mm -hmm. but the idea of kissing under the mistletoe i think is um like an apotropaic thing mistletoe occupies this interesting space in magical lore because it is a parasite it's it's this plant that only grows up in trees and we don't see it until the trees drop their leaves. Mistletoe doesn't grow on conifers. It grows on deciduous trees. And it has these very luscious, alluring white berries that appear in winter when it's snowy and, you know, most of the other fruiting things have died. But if you eat them, you'll go on some weird trips as you hallucinate and quite possibly die because they mm. are very poisonous. And so, you know, it's got those kind of um, dual things of, oh, we found the mistletoe, we got lucky, we found this unique thing, but we are going to dispel the, the poison and the parasite and the everything else that is in this area by kissing, by bringing love into this spot. And then we've got all those connections with, you know, death and sex and and the crossing and that sort of stuff too so again that is all upg um and my my um guesses at things because mm. the lore is super sketchy super sketchy when we get to mistletoe we find practices but it's like cutting the end off of grandma's ham we don't know <laughs> exactly why these practices were started for what reasons because by the time we find them they're old old traditions yeah. but yeah, mistletoe is a bit of a mysterious one yeah and and it doesn't grow everywhere it, it's uh, further from the equator i don't think it grows everywhere i'm gonna have to look at that but i didn't think it grew mm -hmm. in close to the equator in tropical areas because it didn't get cold enough. Yeah, I mean, we have Cape mistletoe here. Mm -hmm. um, I used to go, there used to be some trees at the cemetery I used to live across from that used to have it on. So I used to pick it there. Um, I think it's slightly different to the English mistletoe. I can't remember how though, but yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. A lot of the, the lore about mistletoe is stuff like that where, you know, great boughs of mistletoe and it's always underneath it's never over you don't take it out of the tree to do things it's underneath mm -hmm. and that makes me think it has more to do with the tree being marked by the gods as the mm -hmm. sacred tree you know this dead tree that suddenly blooms life and these white berries and therefore it's a sacred tree and a place to perform rites and it is the mistletoe that marks it as a sacred tree, but it's not like a lot of it, giant trees of mistletoe or anything like that. Just this mm. sudden spot of, of this mysterious life in the dead of winter on this dead tree that suddenly sprouts life. And again, that's all UPG. We don't have mistletoe around here. Um, every once in a while, great once in a while, we find some, but it's not, 
it's not a common plant here. It's just doesn't get cold enough. No. Yeah. Um, what else was there? I'm trying to think of some of the obvious other Yule traditions. So many yeah. Yule traditions. No, I think we covered it all. I think there's a lot of overlap um, between Samhain, Hallowmas, and Yule. And those traditions mm -hmm. when we get down to the the mystical magical stuff and i think that's because this is all a tide um, yeah, it's one winter, isn't it? Yeah. just like there's a lot of overlap between beltane and midsummer because it's all mm -hmm. that that tide on the other end of things you know um we talked about the the via combusta last time we talked about beltane and Samhain and those sorts of traditions. So there's lots of stuff in there. And I think the wonderful thing about all of these holidays is there's a lot of rich, rich lore to dig into and learn about, mm -hmm. especially around the solstice, because every culture pretty much has a solstice celebration. Yeah. This is a, especially, a, especially the Yule one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a marked time uh, and has been a marked time for for many, 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 many peoples over yeah. thousands of years. So. Hmm. All right, then. Then I think we'll end today. And if you have not checked out the links in the description, please go do so. You'll find all of our links in there, Patreon, the coffee link, uh, the Wildwood Temple on Discord and Facebook. And everywhere you will be able to find us. Otherwise, come back next week and you'll find us here, as per usual. For our What's on the Telly that we're releasing for supporters, uh, just last week we released our review of The Matrix because number four is coming out soon. Mm. 22nd i think yeah real soon here so um go check that out and uh next weekend we will be releasing our review of the hogfather to go with the christmas season so mm. if you haven't seen the hogfather whether you watch our review or not go watch the hogfather it's a great great fun tradition mm. and uh next week on friday for the Black Hat Chat, we will be talking about life passage rituals. We had that request um, on our last show, which was rituals last week. So yes. We're going to dig into that. Together. Might, might touch on banishing rituals as well. It's also a request. So, naming and yeah. marriage and divorce and dying and all that sort of stuff, coming of age. Hmm. Uh, Canada Tree Care did say mistletoe grows on native trees in Los Angeles, Sycamore and Elder. Cool. There you go. I'm going to go research shoes and mistletoe. <laughs> shoes, shoes and mistletoe. Shoes and, and socks. Smelly and, socks. And socks and yeah. mistletoe. What are those? <laughs> That's a great thing about these conversations. We wind our way around things, and I, I always find something mm. where I'm like, should know these things. Never looked them up. Uh... Mm -hmm. More learning to do. <laughs> More learning. It might, I'm just wondering if it's a different. Um, I don't know what's what's the difference. Like I've got Cape mistletoe here, and it doesn't get that cold here. I mean, the coldest it gets in winter is like minus five degrees Celsius. Hmm. So... I don't know, and and maybe I'm wrong. Fellow Kansas witches um, may come and correct me and be like, here's some mistletoe. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not a winter person. I don't go outside when it's cold. So I'm not wandering in the woods in the cold winter looking for things. I, I'm totally out there in the summer and the spring looking for all the things. Uh, but frankly, I'm almost always looking at the ground. 
<laughs> there's a herb was that herb was that herb uh <laughs> so maybe maybe i'm totally off base there i don't know but yeah it it drops below freezing and i'm just like uh-uh me and my heated blanket thank you go away <laughs> <laughs> still hibernation time yeah uh, caleb said have a great weekend you too yep. i hope all of you all have right. Happy holidays, whatever holiday solstice you're celebrating, because it's it will be solstice in a few days. Yes. Wherever Happy you solstice are. Day. Mm -hmm. All right then. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye bye.